individual. Well, I'll make sure. Okay. All right, it's four o'clock, so we'll go ahead and start the meeting. Do we want to call the order and roll call? Um, Council Member Fleming? Present. Um, Mayor Rogers and Chair Rogers. Here. Let the record reflect that all subcommittee members are present with the exception of Mayor Rogers. All right. We have one set of minutes on today's agenda. That's the August 2nd, 2023. Did anybody have any amendments to those minutes? All right, let's see if there's public comment on them. Any hands on Zoom? Great. We'll show those minutes adopted without objection. We'll move on to public comment for non-agenda items. Is anybody here to provide a comment that's within the scope of our committee, but not related to an item that's on today's agenda? Go ahead. Uh, my name is John Quinn. I all the parks department and park facilities for many years in this community. We are very under parked and one of the things we ought to be doing is improving our park system, adding acreage to our park system. Uh, we currently have 16 and a half soccer fields according to the city of Santa Rosa website. And I often contrast ourselves with the city of Petaluma. Uh, city of Petaluma has 12 soccer fields uh, four of which are artificial turf and lighted. I don't know of the eight natural grass fields, how many are lighted, but they are a third the size and have almost as many soccer fields as we do. With their having artificial turf fields, they have a lot more capacity on those fields than we do on any natural grass field here in this community. This community has no uh, natural grass fields. It's a problem where we are, it's a problem probably most anywhere. We are up against an urban boundary in the county where we can't expand or we could annex land there, but it's expensive, it's hard, and there's not a lot of infill sites. But we ought to be looking at maximizing all the infill sites for park use. Uh, active recreation, we don't have enough facilities here for active recreation. And uh, we have a young adult population here that is, is really clamoring for access to recreation facilities. And we're not serving them adequately. So you know, part of doing a climate thing is getting more land and uses that can benefit the climate. Um, and I think you know we could do well to have 10 more soccer fields, 20 more soccer fields, and we would fill them. I mean, right now at certain times of the year on fields in this area, we might have six teams practicing on one field because that's the only choice they have. And you know. It would be better for the kids, it would be better for the adults if they had six fields for those 60, well, at least five fields for those 60, you know, those teams to practice on. So, you know, everybody had space. When you were practicing with five other teams on a field, nobody has space to do a good job of their practice. Yeah. And so I think, you know, from an environmental point of view, from a conservation point of view, we need to work hard to get more land in public use for active recreation. And part of that is gonna be uh, high intensity recreation, some of it's gonna be low intensity recreation, but there's a need for both in this area and we gotta do better. All right, thank you. So we can't get into a deep discussion in this because it's not agendized, but I imagine that this will come up when we talk about one of our other items. Get my three, three minutes now, I'll get my three minutes later. Yep, mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Do we have any other hands right. for public comment for non-agenda items? Um, no, and we are, my understanding is we're not taking public comment through Zoom. But I, we have um, Assistant City Attorney Bigger Staff on, and he can correct me if I've misunderstood. We are not taking public comment through Zoom. Okay, I was just making sure it was agendized that way. 
It was. All right, we'll move on to our department reports. Thank you, and we do not have any department reports today. Right. Let's go on then to item 5.1. All right, today we have the update on artificial turf ban investigation, item 5.1, presented by Water Director Jennifer Burke. All right. Do I pull the presentation up over here? Yes, and she'll do so. Okay. The actual. Hello, everyone. This is Morgan Biggerstaff, Assistant City Attorney. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, can you see me? Oh, yeah. now we can. Nope. Okay. All right, yeah. excellent. Just wanted to make sure. And uh, just one comment before Director Burke begins her presentation. I uh, I believe the agenda allows for live streaming so that you can watch the meeting, but we do not take public comments by Zoom as a matter of policy now. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Morgan. All right. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Rogers and uh, Mayor Rogers, Council Member Fleming. You will notice I am not Peter Martin. Uh, I am Jennifer Burke, the director of Santa Rosa Water, and um, Peter was unable to be here today. So I am filling in for him. I will do my best. Um, I am not as much the subject matter expert on this, but we are just starting this process. So I'm here to provide an, an update on our initial start to considering an artificial turf ban investigation or investigation to consider an artificial turf ban. Um, as you are well aware, in your current fiscal year uh, council work plan, uh, under the climate action uh, objective, there is direction for city staff to investigate the feasibility of additional citywide restrictions on artificial turf. Apologies for the two typos in that slide. Um, and so that is what we are starting here today. Uh, just for some reference and information, uh, we wanted to make sure that the public was aware of what synthetic turf, the definitions that we're looking at. So it's a surface cover for residential sports fields and commercial settings uh, made of synthetic fibers. And so tur artificial turf is really meant to provide the same benefit uh, that turf would in terms of being able to play, walk, et cetera, on the field. Um, they are typically made of polyethylene, nylon, or a mixture of the two. And um, we are seeing more different uh, materials making up artificial turf. Um, and they're also looking to make improvements over time to kind of address some of the issues that have come up with synthetic turf uh, since it was first introduced. Uh, we wanted to give a little bit of information on some of the benefits. Um, in particular, it's usually uh, less maintenance, uh, easier to maintain. Uh, we also know that while there are some needs uh, to use water on artificial turf for cleaning purposes, they do use significantly less water uh, than turf or even low water use plantings. Um, this is something to keep in mind uh, right now at the State Water Board. There is a rulemaking going on related to making water conservation a California way of life. So we are getting more and more restricted on how much water we can use. Um, so artificial turf does prevent, uh, provide that benefit. Um, it doesn't require fertilizer and significantly less pesticide and herbicide application than uh, regular turf or natural turf and does allow for year round um, sports applications. So typically you don't have to have people stay off the turf when during the rainy season to protect the turf. Um, and if you have specific questions on that, I know there's parks folks who can answer that specifically, but typically there's a period of time after rain where they have to keep folks off the turf. But there are also concerns with synthetic turf and uh, some of the concerns is that it is an artificial project product. So it is something that will have to be disposed of at some point. Um, typically, we are hearing from the industry that the lifespan can be anywhere from eight to 20 years. And there is really no way to um, recycle 
artificial turf at this time. So artificial turf, when it's uh, used and done, it is a, a waste um, product that goes to the landfill. Um, there are some concerns about the constituents that are in artificial turf in particular. Uh, one of the things that uh, we're very concerned about in the water department is PFOS. Please don't ask me to say the chemical name because I will not get it right, but it's also, it's pretty much known as the forever chemical. Um, it's something we are very concerned about in the water department from a water supply perspective, also from a waste uh, wastewater treatment perspective. So we wanna do everything we can to keep PFOS out of the environment. Um, and so one of the things that we have uh, supported and um, the city council, the mayor signed a letter of support for AB 1423, which is pending legislation that would ban uh, artificial turf uh, from containing PFOS in California. So that is a step in the right direction. We've also seen a number of other um, uh, products uh, in California where including PFOS has been banned. We've always taken support letters on that. So that is good. That's helping us move in the right direction uh, and will hopefully be signed and be applicable to synthetic turf in the future. We also know that there can be heat island effects um, from having artificial turf. And we have heard and, and are continuing to read as we're digging into this that the industry is looking into different ways that they could potentially address that. And then we also know that there is, uh, again, the makeup, a lot of it is tire or rubber um, or old tires that are made uh, into synthetic turf. And so there is concerns with that sort of plastic and crumb material that can come off. We also know that there is very limited information on the human health effects, but there are some in that um, it's the, the makeup and the plastic continuals Con, plastic constituents uh, are known carcinogens in some um, aspects. However, there was a report and an analysis done by the US EPA in 2019 regarding human exposure to these chemicals through synthetic turfs. And in general, it found that there was very little to, to um, provide that human health was actually affected by playing on synthetic turf. So there really was no real evidence to support that um, and that they really need to do a lot more comprehensive data to see if this is any kind of human health exposure risk that should be considered. Um, in terms of the environment, we also know that um, there isn't a lot of data into really trying to quantify or qualify uh, the effects of synthetic turf on the hydrologic process, uh, such as stormwater runoff, retention, drainage. Um, we do know that there have been a number of studies that have been um, supported by the turf industry to show that artificial turf does cause these problems, but we haven't ha found any independent um, studies or information or analysis. Um, so it is something that still we need to try and dig into a little bit more and understand, but there is more and more turf that is being made that is some porous opportunities. So keeping water on site, allowing it potentially to infiltrate into the ground. Um, and we also do know that there can be aerial deposition from various things like cars, brakes, et cetera, that can actually get onto the turf and may run off but I think that's something that can also happen on any porous, on any non-porous material. So that is a concern with artificial turf, where turf provides a benefit and artificial turf does not. We also wanted to provide a little bit of background information on the current uh, California government code, uh, which in essence states that at this time, you cannot enact any ordinance or regulation that prohibits the installation of drought tolerant landscaping, synthetic grass or artificial turf on residential property. However, we do know that there is a bill that is sitting on the governor's desk, which is SB 676. I have not heard whether or not it's been signed yet. We've been trying to track it and I haven't gotten any updates that it has. And if that is signed, that would exclude artificial turf specifically from this government code. But as of right now, we cannot limit it on residential property. 
We also did a little bit of looking into what other jurisdictions are doing related to um, uh, artificial turf. And we know that there are some jurisdictions that have instituted uh, restrictions through building codes and also focusing on trying not to incentivize uh, artificial turf by not allowing it to be rebated through their turf replacement programs. Um, some cases, uh, some jurisdictions have put a, a limit on the percentage of the landscape that can be artificial turf. Some have um, prevented it from being installed on sloped areas. Um, and some have really wanted to make sure that permeability was considered if it was allowed to be installed. One of the things we also did want to point out is we have not, because um, this is very early in and we wanted to get some direction from the subcommittee, we have not had discussions with schools or other facilities or agencies that operate in Santa Rosa and may either currently be using artificial turf, so we'll need to replace it in the future, or maybe considering switching over to artificial turf because they don't have budget for water, um, fit, uh, fiscal budget for water to support um, their fields. And so if, if this is uh, something that we are um, wanting to pursue and get your feedback on how you want us to pursue it, we would definitely recommend that we need to ha start convening, convening some of those stakeholder groups to really understand what they're looking at, what the impacts would be, so that we could bring that back to you all and make sure you fully understand what the ramifications would be if we go down to a turf ban, artificial turf ban. Just sorry, Director, um, mm -hmm. can I just quickly ask a question on that? Do we actually have the jurisdiction to tell a school district that they can't use artificial turf? That is a great question that we will have to get a little bit more information on, but I do know we have some, we have abilities to influence certain things, especially when they're connecting to our water and wastewater system. I, okay. I don't know if that would be the way that we could get into that, but that is something we'd have to do a little bit more research and bring back to you because I don't have an answer on that at this time. Um, we also know um, in talking with at least the Recreation and Parks Department that we have had, uh, they have had a lot of interest from uh, the community in continuing to have um, more all weather fields. So really been pushing for in particular artificial turf um, so that they can have more recreational fields available. Um, and so that's feedback we have received from that department. So something to consider. In terms of what we currently do in Santa Rosa in the water department related to artificial turf, um, we do have our water efficient landscape ordinance that does require very limited landscaping. Uh, we don't have any specific restrictions on synthetic turf, but we do not uh, rebate synthetic turf as part of our water conservation programs. Um, and we have done that for a number of reasons, in particular uh, for the, the fact that artificial turf creates a waste product and because uh, we want to make sure that we're continuing to have as much permeable surfaces as possible. Um, that is really the key drivers as to why we don't rebate artificial turf. I will tell you, uh, as I get many of those complaints, that during drought, that is probably the biggest complaint um, that goes up to my desk is, we are you know very upset that you won't rebate this because we're doing this for the drought to save water um, so that is something that uh, i do get a lot of complaints about but it's not something we rebate and so that's how we uh, feel that we are encouraging folks not to install artificial turf but we're not prohibiting it um let's see uh, one of the things that we would want to better understand is um, if there is interest in going down this road, uh, kind of what the expectations would be for enforcement and what the limitations would be because we are um, concerned about having the ability to enforce what that would look like and where we could plug that in. Um, likely, um, we would need to work with planning and economic development through code enforcement because changes to landscape um, do not uh, trigger typically any kind of permitting that you have to do. And so it would be difficult for us to catch it. Um, and we're not entirely sure how we would go about doing that. So that was another piece we'd like to better understand kind of your direction so we can look at alternatives for what we might be able to do to address enforcement. 
So with that background, and I know it's very high level because we, as I mentioned, are just starting this and plus you get me instead of someone who has more knowledge. So sorry about that. Um, we, we really wanted to better understand from the subcommittee, um, particularly what concerns you wanted us to try and really address and look at in terms of artificial turf. Is it you know more for material makeup? Is it more for environmental you know, impacts, health concerns? And then what additional information would be helpful um, for you all to have us come back with in future subcommittee meetings so that you can make an informed decision on um, what type of, of ban or restrictions we would like to put on artificial turf. So um, I would say I'm happy to answer any questions. I don't know how many questions I'll be able to answer for you, but I am happy to do so. And again, would appreciate um, if you could provide us the, this direction so that we can um, work through this with other departments and come back to you with um, some more robust ideas on how to implement this. So thank you. All right, let's start with questions. Um, so you talked about the relationship between the use and the water system. Do you, I know you're not, this is not your area of specialty, so not, not a big deal if you don't know an answer, but um, do you or anybody else on staff here know exactly how it works that this turf gets laid down and then we end up with, um, with you know, these hazardous chemicals in our water system? Is it after rain? Is it after um, just time that seeps into the earth? So, and I don't know if any folks want to try and jump in, um, but in general, when you have um, materials, um, in particular, like I can talk to PFOS, right? So if PFOS is in there, it's basically kind of getting out into the environment over time. And so any kind of rain, any kind of walking on it would potentially get it you know, into the soil, whether or not then the soil can treat it in any way doesn't seem likely, but it is concerns that we continue to have. And I, and I don't want to target just artificial turf because PFOS is in everything. So we're really looking at how we can ban. It is definitely more of an impact for us on the wastewater side for things that people are either ingesting and putting, you know, in some fashion with PFOS or putting on their bodies that are eventually going into the sewer system. That is our much bigger concern. So anything that we can do to get PFOS out of products is, is what we're looking to do. Um, so it's not specific to artificial turf, but that is one, one mechanism that we need to do more research, but it is something that is of concern, which is why we supported and encouraged the council to support that particular legislation, because anytime we can get PFOS out of a product, it's just going to be better for us in the long run. Okay. The other question I have is about the ecosystem. You talked about you know, heat islands, but you didn't mention you know, what this does to all the tiny creatures and bugs and so forth that might live under this thing that's going to get incredibly hot and has chemicals associated with it. Can you speak to that at all? I, a little bit. I mean, we have done, uh, we've gathered some information. There is impact to the soil. So it is better if the soil can have access to uh, air and natural environment so that it's not, um, uh, so that organisms can continue to have that sort of biomass there. Um, so that is an impact. Um, I don't have a lot of details on how much of an impact that is, but it is something that is of concern. Thank you. That's all my questions for you. My question is really about the benefits with artificial turf that you mentioned, uh, all weather ability, um, uh, more solid playing surface, all of those sorts of things. Are those achievable in a natural grass surface uh, with proper staffing, proper, proper maintenance, proper treatment. Uh, I am going to ask if you don't mind that the director of parks, our interim director of parks and recreation answer that. I do know that um, I'll just say from a, you know, immediate rain, there is always a suspension of time um, that is needed for turf grass. But. Right. And, and, and does that apply to artificial also? Typically it wouldn't, not, not as long of a time. Right, I think that's the that's the thing that we're looking at here with our use of artificial turf is that it allows for a longer playing time and allows for multiple sports on the same field over and over again. You heard from our some citizens that we you know don't have enough fields. So I think that's part of the problem. So 
you know, one solution is to multiply those fields uh, a lot more than we had envisioned in the future because we'd envision using what the community is requesting is kind of a multi-purpose field. So it does it does create um, it does create the opportunity for recreational opportunities and more types of sports. Uh, we have rugby folks, we have softball, baseball, um, all of those can be used on that same field. So it becomes a, a huge benefit to the teams. Uh, with that, and with the grass field, it's a little harder because they need to rest in between uh, the whatever game was played on it before they need they need a rest in between there. And like uh, Director Brooks said previously, we will we will rest fields um, so that they can recover from that. So um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question entirely, but that's you know we have a lot of benefits from the recreational side of, of things with the with the artificial at this moment. It, to change that, we'd have to expand the system greatly. And I don't know if any of my colleagues from Recreational Parks have anything better, more wonderful to add, but that's where I'll leave it. Okay. Any other questions? Comments, no questions. All right, let's do public comment then first, then we'll bring it back. Go ahead, sir. And we'll do three minutes of public comment for folks. I'll try to flag you down when you get close to the three. You know, I, I actually have to go coach little soccer players a little bit, so I'm going to yeah. yep. go quick. And Please jump in. Um, my name is Mark Markarian. Um, I'm the competitive director for Empire Soccer Club. We have probably getting close to 1,700 kids in our club. It's a large club. Um, and then John can speak on the, the whole league as a whole uh, and the other clubs in town. Um, but we have a lot of players. Um, and I can't disagree. I mean, the presentation was uh, was very good. and. There's, I probably agree with all of it naturally. As a matter of fact, if you asked a soccer person or a sports person where, what's a better surface to play on, they're going to say grass because it, it honestly is better. It's safer. It's better on your body. Um, but the reality is it's different. The reality is, is that we don't have the millions and the manpower to actually keep and maintain grass throughout the year, uh, and especially in our climate. Um, and um, I know in our club, uh, with the, we, we have – pushing 700 kids just in competitive soccer, which nowadays is almost year round, um, they would be playing year round. And that just increases the, it's a, we provide a, a very large part of physical education for this town. It's because they're practicing two or three days a week. They have games on the weekend. Um, it's a big part of their lives and it's a very healthy um, option obviously for them. And so the more we can expand on that, the better. Um, as a really great example, um, we can barely use one of our soccer fields, and I'm not faulting the reason why, but the reason is because there's men that play on, on it on a Sunday, and they have a right to play on it just like we do. The problem is, is that we can't play on it anymore in a safe manner because when you have men that are you know 200 plus pounds playing soccer from eight till five o'clock, it's it destroys the field. Um, if this was a turf option, it would never even be a consideration. So um, speaking for, you know, for the youth, and I've been at this for about 20 years in this town, that's, that's, uh, that's what our, our feeling is, is that a, the mix of having the grass fields and having some turf options and expand on that is, 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 would, would be, I think, beneficial for the whole community. All right. Thank you, sir. Well, I, I'll correct a little bit and expand a little bit. And, you know, I didn't have a lot of time to prepare for this because I didn't know about this meeting until this morning. Uh, but I did a little bit of research today, which I think would help inform some of these considerations. I looked on the web and I said, you know, how many hours a week can you use a, an athletic field, like natural grass athletic field? And the answer was 13 to 16 hours uh, for a heavy use activity like soccer, 13 hours. And so, I have been involved in an artificial turf complex in the, this greater Santa Rosa area for nearly 20 years. I know in the spring and fall, we get 60 hours of use by kids on that field uh, every week. And let me define what an hour of use is. And I do it the way FIFA, the International Soccer Organization does it. If you put 22 players on a field and play a game of soccer, that's an hour worth of use. So if you put 66, uh, 66 kids on a field for 
an hour and a half to play it, uh, to practice, that's three hours of use for times one and a half hours, four and a half hours of use. So it's, it's use based. Um, if we had lights on that facility like that, and you had adults playing in the evening or after sunset, um, you could easily get up to 75, 80, 90 hours of use every week. Now, to convert that, it, you know, take that and divide it by uh, 13 hours, you'd have to replace that one artificial turf field with six, seven, eight natural grass fields to get the same utility for our community. Um, I've researched the cost of construction. I seriously looked at putting in natural grass fields some years ago, and it is substantially the same money to put in a good quality natural grass field as it is an artificial turf field. And so if you want to go acquire the land and put in, you know, six, seven, eight times as many uh, fields in natural grass, you'd serve the community. But you could do it a lot cheaper by uh, putting in artificial turf fields, particularly with lights. You know, some of the issues that were raised about the detractions from artificial turf. Uh, I had a conversation today in anticipation of this meeting with one of the major uh, vendors of artificial turf in the United States, probably the largest vendor in the United States, and they are recycling fields, uh, complete recycling fields. If you go on the FIFA website, they document how they are recycling fields in Europe. It is not a, a presumed assumption that you can't recycle the fields. I put in two artificial turf fields outside of the city of Santa Rosa four years ago, I fully anticipate recycling all the infill material. All that infill material is virgin material. It doesn't contain all the bad chemicals that are in SBR. Uh, and if you start looking at the carpet itself, it's much like this carpet here on this floor. It's a synthetic material. It has the same pluses and minuses as this carpet on the floor. If you're worried about those chemicals, I challenge you all to pull out your carpet and put silk and wool carpet in your homes. I mean, these are ubiquitous things in our lives. The PFAS, you know, the industry will respond and will eliminate PFAS if the legislation requires that. Uh, you know, it, it, the PFAS is not going to be an issue on this in particular. Um, and then I asked the question, you know, how many fields around here are still using SBR, uh, crumb rubber? And the answer I got, in Northern California, 98% of the fields currently are not using crumb rubber. They're using alternate infills. I mean, we, we used a virgin infill material that completely unrelated to crumb rubber tires. So all this literature that, that people look at that's based on artificial turf fields from 20, 30 years ago, a lot of that's based on SBR fields, which had a different chemical profile completely. Um, the the heat island, let's get you to wrap up, please. Okay, I'll just one thing on the heat island effect. The field that uh, fields that I put in four years ago were designed to not be hot, and they have a special infill that I, I believe is probably the state of the art infill to keep the field cool. In the hottest days of the summer, you can walk on that field bare feet. It is not that hot. I mean, an SBR field, you could never do that. Uh, you know, it plays probably 30 degrees cooler than an SBR field. So the technology exists. Don't sit there and, and paint all artificial turf fields with one brush. Right. Thank you. Anybody else? Hi, um, my name is Megan Cowan. I'm Thank you for coming. I'm here representing Sonoma Safe Ag Safe Schools, but also a, a bunch of other local nonprofits, including families advocating for chemical and toxic safety um, and non-toxic schools. Um, and I actually have a few questions for you. Sure. Um, but one of the comments that Director Burke made in the beginning of our presentation stuck with me, and that quote was that plastic grass uses significantly less pesticide and herbicide application. Um, and what I've heard is that the warranties require pesticide application in plastic grass. Um, so the same as what Jennifer um, presented. Um, right now, to my understanding, none of the turfs and fields, the natural fields in Sonoma and Santa Rosa use any pesticides uh, to maintain them. 
And so introducing plastic grass would actually require, I, I believe, pesticide use to comply with warranty. Um, in, in the I've case read of lots of warranties from lots of turf manufacturers. Nobody has Let her finish her, her comments, not get in the back yeah, and forth. I am curious, but yeah. yeah. Um, so that's, you, that's, you two can talk for sure offline. Yeah, I can't, I can't wait. Um, and so that, that's a main concern of mine, and I know the second agenda that we're talking about is pesticide use in Santa Rosa, um, so I'll leave the rest of the comments on that, for that agenda item. Um, but you know, it, at Lucchesi Field in Petaluma, um, we recorded uh, the temperature being 171 degrees um, on July 15th uh, last summer. Uh, it was a 93 deg degree day and it was 100 degrees in the natural grass. So 71 degrees difference in temperature. Um, and there have been deaths um, on artificial turf, turf that I've read about um, because it, it can get hot. Um, and, that's just something that's a big concern, especially in climate change. And to answer your question, um, Council Member Fleming, um, it, it's very hard for the other beings in the ecosystem to have that type of temperature uh, difference when you're including um, not natural uh, materials. Um, Non-toxic schools last week did a professional training on managing organic turf um, for uh, resilience, um, for, uh, you know, to be non-toxic, um, to, you know, not do the go, have, have the gopher problem, et cetera. And so there are methods of, um, of having natural turf um, that can be very functional. Um, however, I mean, I, I do believe in, in the chance of rain that you would not be able to play. And I mean, I'm sure that the numbers that this gentleman has given as far as usability are, are correct. Um, I, you know, in Petaluma, they have a lot of artificial turf. Um, and when it's not changed over promptly, which is always, right, because everything's always delayed and, you know, things don't have happen when they should, um, if you go to the field, the plastic is crumbling. So there's microplastics all over the place. And it's in the air. It associates with the dust, all the contaminants, including PFAS. Um, but other things, too, um, are associated in this dust, and they get into the groundwater, they're inhaled by the kids, they get into the environment. There's no way of controlling it. Um, and even if PFOS is taken out of the artificial turf, don't worry, there'll be another terrible chemical that'll be in there. I mean, it's, it's the whack-a-mole issue that we have with plastics. Um, and so... You know, there's there's no perfect answer here, um, and of course, my heart goes out to kids that want to play soccer and da, da 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 da. But I think the question is, you know, moving forward, is this a sustainable choice for us to make in the in the age of climate change and all this stuff that's going on with our climate? Like, do we really want to put plastic grass that increases the temperature, that increases toxicity into the environment? And I mean. Are we, is our plan to just have sports fields for the next thousand years where we have to replace the, the plastic and throw it in the landfill every whatever, eight to 20 years? I don't know if that feels sustainable to me. So thank you for listening to my comments. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Do we have anybody else? James? You're good. All right, I'll go ahead and bring it back. Uh, so what kind of direction would be helpful today? Uh, what concerns you want us to focus on um, so that we can, if you want us to uh, look at a, uh, some type of restrictions or ban, what are the things that you want us to really target? Um, and then what information would be helpful uh, to bring back for you so that you can make an educated recommendation on, on what we would propose? Okay. Start with the mayor. Um, so definitely I would be concerned about how we explain this to, um, the general public, if we're saying that they can use some turf, if we're doing residential, if they can use some turf, but they can't use others and to explain to them about the, the chemicals. And if someone already has this in their yard, like, are we going to help them to get rid of, I mean, there's just like a lot of questions I have about how we would get it out to the general public and how we would uh, support and assist them with that. I am very happy when children are able to uh, play sports. Um, but I think that we cannot do it at the expense of their health. Um, but I also know that PFOS is also in feminine products. So I think that we have a, a lot of uh, a lot of stuff we need to look at. And um, so I would just need more more data, really. 
that's what it boils down to me is more data. I don't feel like we have enough. And is that in on um, health impacts and or what could you just talk a that, little bit more about the, the more data you would like? I, I think that would be on the health impacts, but um, I, I think it's more data on just how would it impact um, the general public and also how would it impact uh, Santa Rosa's ability to, to care for our facilities. I think that that's a, a big thing. So, um, thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you, Director Burke, and thank you to everybody who made the time to come out today. You know, the way that I look at this is that as we continue to urbanize, as the planet continues to get warmer and our population becomes more dense, in the city limits, uh, we have to balance our need to increase opportunities to recreate, which it's very clear we don't have enough adequate spaces to do that, and that it absolutely cannot come um, at the expense of heating the planet one iota or, or contaminating it. And so, you know, the kind of, I mean, I don't personally need any more information than I have here today. I'm sure the council will need more. It's very clear to me what we should do. Uh, in terms of the, at least the public spaces, the private residential spaces are, is a, a more difficult question to answer um, as far as how we deal with that or with the school districts. But at least for the city of Santa Rosa, it, it's my goal that we we don't allow any um, artificial turf um, in public city land and that simultaneously we explore how to build out adequate spaces for people to recreate. And that that's not limited to soccer fields. There's frankly not enough tennis courts, there's not enough pickleball courts, there's they're just not enough. And it's something that I continue to push for is for us to really have strong investments both in capital improvements and and operational funding for, for recreation. And I know that's a little bit sort of a sideways on this, but it really does intersect here that you know we're feeling the pinch because we have a lot of families, children and frankly adults and we all want to run around and play if we if we are physically able to do so. And it's in the city's best interest to facilitate that. But I think that it's, it's a real false um, choice to say it's recreation versus the environment. It used to be the environment versus housing development. And we kind of start, sort of set that aside and have acknowledged that we have to focus on investing in this thing that is the public commons, the public good. Which is, which is housing. And, and I think we need to take a similar approach to recreation and not pit one cause against another. I believe that the city, if it, it so chose to do so, we could either partner with the schools. You know, frequently I get calls from people who are tennis instructors, are, are soccer instructors, wanting to use school land. And I, I call the schools and they say, we're busy, we're overwhelmed, we're all this stuff. So what could we as a city do to facilitate partnerships with schools um, to increase the hours of playable time on, on these shared resources, which are another public good, right? And then what can we do to add or add requirements um, that don't encumber development, but encourage developers to put more open space, perhaps not the size of soccer fields, um, but that as we continue to build out our city, that we make sure there's adequate recreation spaces. Um, I think that going forward, it's going to be important to have the data on health, human health and environmental impacts from this stuff for my colleagues. But um, I'm completely sold that the, that the answer to this question is to toss out the, the dichotomy of environment versus recreation and move forward in a way that supports both causes. Um, as far as the private stuff, um, I would need a little bit more time than today to figure out how to solve the enforcement thing. That's um, something I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out. And currently, our system, as you well know, is based on uh, is complaint driven, and and that's really challenging, I think, for residents and staff. And something that I'd like to see maybe a few proposals come forward, uh, or a study session where the council can look at at um, the the structure of code enforcement, both as it applies to this and other things, and and really kind of have an opportunity to hear from the public about what would be most effective. And if the public has a desire for us to divert more resources to code enforcement officers um, to be more proactive, or if they'd like to continue this current trajectory of having it be complaint-based and um, sort of vexatious to um, complainants and uh, people who are complained against simultaneously. Um, that, that one, I don't, don't envy anybody who has to deal with this issue, whether it's the staff, the council, or the code enforcement officers. 
Did that satisfy your questions? Yes. Okay. So I think I'm hearing um, you have enough data more for the um, the council, which I appreciate um, that you really are targeting, if I understood correctly, no artificial turf in city spaces at this time and would need more time for residential if that's something to consider. Right, and you did ask about what it would take to partner with the schools. And I'd like to emphasize like partner with the schools. I could see that the first response to anybody where you know you have limited resources is to say like, this is cheap, this is easy, this is what we're gonna do and we're gonna move on. So if we can um, somehow drum up or get grant funding to support them to, to move towards these solutions, especially if the legislature goes in this way of of wanting to eliminate the PFAS or any other things. I mean, they, they can't want this. I mean, when a player falls, I mean, most most elite athletes won't play on this stuff because they just get these rug burns that are real nasty. I mean, we shouldn't be putting our kids on something that, you know, an athlete won't play on. It doesn't make any sense to me. So we ought to figure out how, if we have the capacity to support them in partnering with us, both to open up their space and convert what they have um, and, and commit to not putting in future uses. Yeah, we'll definitely do some research on that. Um, and I and I don't have a lot of answers for that. Um, I am not aware, but our, you know, my knowledge is really based on water. Um, there are no- Is it now? Yeah. Uh, sorry. There are no uh, uh, grant funding or incentives that is gonna encourage turf to be put back in. Uh -huh. So if it's artificial, we're not gonna find grant funding to say, switch it back right. to turf. So right. I mean, and you know, it's funny for me to be advocating for, um, you know, actual, you know, grass, because in general, I'm not, you know, if there was not a, a lick of grass outside of a soccer or playing field in this in the city or, you know, a picnic area or something like that, that would make me thrilled. But I think that in the context of the active recreation, it's absolutely necessary. No, yeah, that, that's why we have a turf, you know, turf uh, removal program. <laughs> right, and I used it, it was fantastic. And one of my neighbors who put in uh, artificial turf was quite missed that she didn't get reimbursed for it. So that was a little awkward. <laughs> Thank you, Councilmember Fleming. Yeah. yeah. So uh, for me, I just want to start with sort of the overall picture around plastics. Uh, we need to reduce plastics. Uh, we see it getting into human bodies, into our waterways. Uh, it, it isn't a good thing, just talking plastics holistically, right? Um, it's being found in breast milk. It's being found in heart tissue. It's finding its way into bodies. So I'm going to start there. Uh, my understanding from doing significant research is that it is not recyclable, that there are places that say that they will recycle it and at best they incinerate it, which has different health impacts for the surrounding communities that are around the incinerators. But in terms of actual recycling or reusing of the turf, there is nowhere that does that, that there's one place up in Canada that is trying to do that but that they have not yet actually figured out how to do that. So if somebody has uh, research that they can send me, but, uh, but every single time consistently when I've been told that there's a group, there's a, a company that recycles it, when you actually look into it, the answer is they don't really, uh, they're just trying to. Uh, so I wanna start there that when we look at our climate action plan and the long-term sustainability of our city, it does not make sense for us uh, economically uh, or environmentally to do things that we're gonna have to change out the turf every eight to 20 years. Uh, and 20 years I think is being super optimistic based on what other communities are finding, particularly for the use that, that they've seen from them. Uh, I think that there's a, a false dichotomy that I think when we come back for a more substantive discussion about what uh, a prohibition or a moratorium or a ban might look like to see also to keep our fields in playing shape uh, for a reasonable standard comparable to what you see right now with uh, plastic grass synthetic turfs uh, that you put that on council to say you can have almost the same level of play but it's going to take this so that we can evaluate not just the health impacts or the ease or other things that we're talking about but really looking long term at the city's finances and how we quite frankly fund the department to the level that it needs to meet the level of service that we want without having to compromise health for children, right? Uh, my colleague mentioned uh, falling down and getting rug burns. I've been uh, pretty interested in watching the NFLPA's response to Aaron Rodgers being out for the season. 
uh, go Cowboys. Uh, and uh, <laughs> you see one athlete after another uh, pointing out the turf and the, the challenges around turf. You see studies that have been coming out, particularly about the heat island effect and the impact that that has on ACL, MCLs, uh, body mechanics as you're, you're playing on it. Um, so would be more interested in hearing more about turf that doesn't heat up because that hasn't been the experience that most people have had. Uh, it does contribute to heat island effect and, uh, and, and we do know people who go around and actually take the temperature to, to verify. Uh, and then finally, you, you mentioned that there's no grant funding out there for conversion. Uh, I actually had a chance to meet with some of the folks that were in town last week that were talking about this. And we'll obviously talk about this a little bit in the next item as well. Uh, but there are folks that are looking for pilot projects of uh, helping cities in, in doing a couple of different conversions back from synthetic turf into a properly managed field. And I found actually the discussion really interesting, even from a climate perspective, about the self-fulfilling prophecy of using things like uh, synthetic grass, of using things like uh, synthetic herbicides. Uh, one of the data points I was telling Jason as I came in, uh, one of the data points uh, that stuck with me is that even if we're just reducing uh, our carbon impact and trying to move away from petroleum-based fuels, that for every one ton of fertilizer takes four tons of petroleum to make it. Uh, so does it make sense for us as a city to be designing a system that requires more fertilizers to keep up because we're using more pesticides that then inevitably ends up using uh, synthetic turfs that then destroys the soil health as well? I, I think if we get back to a sustainable point and have sustainable practices, long term is better for the community. So the last thing, and then I'll, I'll uh, wrap it up. You asked about things that we're concerned about with this. So for me, it's the heat island effect. It's the overall plastics use. It's the loss of ecological value for bees, butterflies, birds, other types of ecology. It's uh, long-term impacts to, to children. And then yes, how do we replace that with something where the user experience is going to be the same uh, or better? Uh, by managing our parks and what would that actually take for us to do. And I love the idea of more parks. Uh, I love the idea of more turfs, even things like uh, pop-up pr uh, practice areas that maybe aren't the full field, but if we already have multiple teams practicing on each field, maybe finding smaller areas where we can have, you know, half fields for practices uh, works, works for me. Yeah. Chair Rogers, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that I think that if we separate um, residential and what we're going to do as a city for city owned uh, properties and working with schools and stuff, I think that that would be um, easier uh, to take to council initially if we separate them. I think you have to look at enforcement. You have to, look, there's like a lot that you have to look at when you're going um the residential route um but i'm really big on educating the public and hopefully by education then they will um know a little bit more when they're picking uh landscaping materials um within their homes and how it can affect them right because it's it's affecting them when they have gardens and they have things and their children are outside playing and so uh, education is a really big thing for me so i think to separate the two, and if we wanted to start anywhere, start with uh, educating as far as residential is concerned. Is your intention to bring something back to this committee or bring something straight to council? No, we would come back to this committee. Mm -hmm. um, so a couple things. One, um, uh, so I just want to make sure I'm clear. So it sounds like at least from the majority of this committee, it's really focusing on the the public spaces, so city owned and potentially looking at schools as well. Is that is that the direction? Uh, I'm personally not ready to limit it. I'd like to, especially if we're coming back to this committee and not going straight to council for a quick decision on something, I'd rather get all of the information about what's possible. Okay. Uh, and what, I mean, obviously you said it right on the first slide, there's more outreach that needs to happen to the sports community, to our neighborhoods and whatnot. Um, and so I, I wouldn't want to bifurcate the discussion yet. Uh, maybe down the road, down the road, that makes more sense. But for now, I think talking about pros and, and cons of turf in general uh, should apply, can apply across all of it. 
So I, I would sort of split split the baby here. I would say that I think that the mayor is right that for the purposes of council policy, that uh, these are there's three separate issues. There's what we do in municipal lands, which is the easiest one, what we do with the schools, and then what we do residentially. I think for educational purposes, the chair is completely right. And that if we have a conversation and that we're, we're just educating the council, we're not asking for a comprehensive policy. I think if we're gonna have a comprehensive policy that addresses all three of those things in one day, it's gonna be real messy. Um, so just speaking to the education, and again, um, you know, there's, there's other departments here, so I, I really can only I know I won't say it again, but my focus is water. water so. Yes. <laughs> so um, we do have a number of educational materials that we already do related to turf and artificial turf. The Russian River Friendly Landscape Guidelines that really are about in harmony with um, the environment, using less materials, using less pesticides, less herbicides, less water. So we have that all over the place and that information is out there. Uh, we also do uh, can certified gardens that are Russian River friendly. We also have our Water Our World program, which specifically targets um, uh, nurseries and other landscape material providers. That's all about using less synthetic, whatever it may be. So we have a lot of that education already out there. And then I do believe um, based on, again, the feedback we've received and the complaints we've received that by not rebating, that's also a big piece that is educating the residential. So there's a lot of education already that is that is very much out there and we can definitely bring that back and explain uh, to the committee everything that we have in place. So I think we have that pretty well dialed in, uh, both from the water department, um, specifically the water, water use piece and the storm water piece. Um, so we can definitely bring that back and let you know all those pieces that we do have in place from an education perspective already. Um, so, um, and then, so if we bring that back as well as um, sort of more options related to the public spaces, does that meet the direction from this committee or do you, or do you still all want to see what options would be for residential. Because I'm just trying to make sure that we're bringing, because we want to bring this back to you. This, I will just want to make sure you're, um, um, you know, this is going to be multiple departments that we're going to have to coordinate with because we're just really focusing right now on very limited um, information and knowledge that we have from the, the water side and sort of those benefits related to water and stormwater. Um, but we'll have to make sure that we're working with um, planning and economic development uh, from an enforcement perspective because we don't have that ability. Uh, we'll also have to work uh, with Rec and Parks quite significantly um, because all those pieces are going to be basically what, um, you know, the information on what it would take to replace those fields and the costs and the information is going to have to come from that department. Right. So this is going to take us quite a bit of time to bring this back and I want to make sure that we're doing the pieces that you all want to see so we can bring it back appropriately. And it may be that we have to come back a couple of times. Yeah, and I'd, I'd, I'd like to see it all. And in particular, I mean, the conversation might be limited just by the governor not signing the piece of legislation and then the law is pretty clear. We can't do anything yes. on residential. If, right? that, if that doesn't happen, then yes, that we won't be able to make that change. No. So I'm, I'm with the chair. If, um, if it's coming back to this committee, I think that um, it would be very useful to, to have all three elements. I just want to, as long as the, my, my colleagues agree, agree that there are three distinct sort of policy pieces here. There's like the, do we, as a, a committee or a council, agree that synthetic turf is, is not something that we want to have? And then how do we want to implement that as a policy in those three different areas? So. Um. I would say I, depending on how the governor goes, but I still think it needs to come to council as a whole oh, absolutely. Um, separately. And so I would want us to, I mean, we need to do more anyway to figure out what we're doing, but I would want to um, concentrate more on um, what the city is doing, you know, like the city stuff and then residential stuff kind of put it to the side because that's a lot of that's a lot of manpower like you have to go to how they're going to enforce it you're going to have to i mean there's there's a lot of 
a lot of pieces, I, I think that would be involved in residential if we're looking at that. And I, I wouldn't want to dive that deep yet. I would just want to see how we're going to do the city. And then, and, and a lot of the information you already have will be uh, helpful when you do residential. But I will divert to the chair. That's just my, my opinion yeah. because it takes a lot of work when you have to collaborate with a lot of different um, departments yet we may or may not move on something i think it takes a lot of a lot of work and some of the material you get at that time maybe outdate i mean so let's bring it all <laughs> bring it all back okay <laughs> and we can have the discussion about before we send something to council what's the appropriate yeah. scope right but bring it all back to us okay um and we will um so we would come back with more information, you know, get your direction. We would definitely bring this then to council and study session um, and get direction from the council as a whole uh, before we would finalize anything that would go forward. Sure. Um, two things I just want to note. One is just that um, uh, in regards to, um, oh shoot, I just lost, oh, uh, code enforcement. Um, so it, yes, much more complex on the residential side. I just don't want to lose the piece that it is also, you know, on the municipal side, we know what we're doing. But if we're looking at schools or other private fields, that would also be a code enforcement issue that we'd have to figure out. Because as I mentioned, there's no trigger for when they need to, you know, if they want to replace it and make changes to their landscape, there's no permitting trigger, right? So it would, it's definitely going to be something that's going to be complicated. Um, so I just want to make sure that, you know, I was clear on that piece. And then also um, just, you know, was mentioned before I, um, again, and just wanted to be clear. Yeah, there absolutely could be pilot projects or other things about um, ecological restoration for various aspects. I'm just not aware from a water perspective of any grants that would get us to put high water use back in. So yeah. that, that was just the that so there absolutely could be ecological restoration money out there that I'm not aware of that just wouldn't be relevant to what we do. So. Yeah, understood. And last, um, I'm sorry about Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Uh, I love I, I'd love that moment when I can tell somebody's not going to answer my call on Monday. <laughs> let's move on I to mean, the next. Come on. Uh, let's move on to the next item. All Thank right. you very much. Yep. Appreciate it. Thank you, Director Burke. And our next item, 5.2, Development of the City's Comprehensive Integrated Pet Management Policy, presented by Sean McNeil, Deputy Director of Environmental Services. All right. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor Rogers, Chair Rogers, and Council Member Fleming. I think this is a great opportunity to really just focus on landscape today. I, I'm, I'm excited about the energy around this. And as you'll see in the presentation, we are really looking for input on how best to build um, an integrated pest management uh, that you would be proud of for our city. There we go. Thank you. And, oops. Oh, we got to share? No. Yeah, we do got to share. Go, go back here. Okay. Jennifer. Yes. Were you asking? No, he was looking at. Oh, okay. Oh, it's not that chair. Like her name That's the wrong chair. Cancel that. Okay. All right. So uh, today I'm Sean McNeil uh, with the Water Department, and this presentation was put together in conjunction with Jen Santos uh, and other members of her team uh, to really kind of think about what we could do for integrated pest management. So the project description really is um, the goal of this is to develop a citywide integrated pest management strategy. As I've dug into it, we used to think we had a citywide one. It turned out we didn't. 
we had a departmental-wide um, integrated pest management. Uh, and so we developed our own program for the water department. There's a different program for the parks department. And we just think it would be a good time to start thinking about, let's get one that is for the whole city so that we're all in alignment. Uh, this plan would provide guidance to staff and contractors who work for the city uh, to ensure that landscapes are designed and maintained in a manner that reduces the need for fossil fuels, powered equipment, herbicides, insecticides, and other anthropomorphic inputs that have an ability to exacerbate uh, climate change. And the relationship of this policy to uh, the Climate Action Plan is that integrated pest management is a programmatic approach that's geared towards protecting human health and the environment. Um, we have healthy, vibrant uh, landscapes. These are greater carbon sinks, and they provide relief from the heat island effects in the urban environment. So if we can maintain our landscapes uh, in, in this manner, then we can have uh, reduce the impacts of um, climate change on our, our population. So the outline for today's talk is I'll give a brief definition of integrated pest management, also IPM, uh, do a history of IPM in the city, and it'll be really brief with just the salient points, uh, and then go into uh, we do actually have requirements in some of our permits for integrated pest management on the city. We are currently meeting those. We think we could do it simpler with a, a, a policy. Uh, and then kind of go through the different types of landscapes that we manage so that you could think about like what would a solution look like that might help us manage all these different uh, <laughs> landscapes and their needs. And then um, really kind of dive into a discussion of desired integrated pest management policies that you guys would like to see us incorporate into a policy. We currently don't have a policy for you to shoot holes at. It's really, let's build it from the, the ground up. That's our goal. So a quick definition of integrated pest management. Um, it's really, as it sounds, it's to address you know, issues related to pests. Pests can be any kind of organisms that um, get in the way of some functionality that we have. So they can be uh, fungus or bacteria causing um, certain diseases in plants or animals. Uh, they could um, be plants that aren't wanted for a specific need uh, so that you have, um, uh, we typically call those weeds. Uh, and then we have a whole host of animals that need to be controlled in our environment. Uh, and that could be from fleas to, to rodents to um, ground dwelling mammals. Uh, and we'll talk about some concerns we have about ground dwelling mammals on properties that we maintain. Um, and so the, there's a lot of things that go into this. Um, these practices to control them a lot of people think, oh, pest management is pesticides. It's not, that's, that's usually in an integrated pest management strategy, that's the end of the process. You're looking at what's the least toxic way to address this issue from the start all the way through. Uh, so um, these practices could include biological control. That would be, you know, I think commonly you think of people putting out um, ladybird, ladybird beetles uh, in their gardens. Some people call them ladybugs, but they're ladybird beetles. Uh, uh, and they put those out in their garden to help uh, deal with aphids and things like that. Uh, but you could also have habitat manipulation. A lot of weed control issues are developed by having a very solid ground cover a solid ground cover that could be a plant base or it could be uh, mulch or and things like that will help uh, reduce weeds. Um, also, uh, cultural practices. So you can do weed eaters, mowers, you know, things like that to take care of weeds. Uh, and, and also, if you have plants that have lots of pests associated with them, thinking of fruit trees, thinking of uh, roses and things like that, there are pest um, resistant varieties which then reduce the need for the use of pesticides. So in an integrated pest management uh, policy, we're looking to do all of those things before we go into the toolbox of pesticides. But then when we do get into a toolbox of pesticides, we wanna make sure that we're using them after it's been evaluated. So we know what we're trying to target and we're using the right and least toxic approach um, uh, for targeting that. 
Uh, so we're looking for guidance from um, you guys on, on how that would best be presented to council and then for the entire council, should we decide to develop a citywide uh, integrated pest management uh, program. Um, and then one of the key issues here and in different environments, it's gonna be a different answer is that we apply any kind of pest controls that minimizes risk to human health and the environment. So we have to look at, it's, it's prudent to look at if we use a specific activity in one area, it may not be the best activity in another area, given the constraints. And I have some examples of that later in the presentation. So integrated pest management in the city, I've already kind of mentioned this, but there really are two efforts that we have. Uh, the parks department uh, has an integrated pest management departmental policy that guides their staff use uh, as well as contractors. And then the water department has taken a different route where we, uh, develop, we work to develop this Russian River friendly landscape guidelines. And then we built a, um, an RFP to uh, our contractor to make sure that they are doing um, Russian River friendly guidelines and IPM is a component of that. And I'll talk a little bit more about both of those. Um, so the parks department policy, uh, it's written for park staff and contractors that are working on parks, uh, properties that are managed by the parks department. It's really, I say solely, I, th I think it's probably like if, if I could go back and change that word, it's, it's focused on um, integrated pest management only. And, and this is just in contrast to our Russian River friendly uh, landscape guidelines that we work with in the water department. But we do have integrated pest management in our process, but this is solely an integrated pest management pro um, policy. And the guidelines come from the experts at the UC Ag Extensions Office. Um, and it is an excellent policy for pest management activities because it does follow through in the stepwise progression to make sure we're using least toxic things, control mechanisms first, uh, before we enter into anything that might be hazardous uh, to the public or our workers. And then it only applies to the parks department and its contractors. So that's part of a, a problem that we see at staff is we'd like something that is unifying so that we're all doing, so you can feel comfortable that what we're doing here is the same as what we're doing in the water department lands, you know, and on the parking facilities and all of that. So um, the Santa Rosa Waters Landscaper Guidance is we developed a, a request for proposals, so a bidding process uh, for landscape services to make sure that all the city owned pro or the water department owned properties um, were being managed following the Russian River friendly landscape guidelines. Uh, it's more of a holistic approach to landscape management. IPM, as I mentioned, is a component of it as well. But then we have a lot of other things like reducing organic wastes, going to the landfill, supporting on-site composting and, and building around in our landscapes, we provided areas. So like if they're mowing our lawns, we provided areas for them to put those clippings so that they're mulching in our, our um, landscapes instead of the hauling them away, taking them to a landfill and being a part of that. So those are just kind of a, a different approach that the water department took, but we don't have staff who maintain landscapes. It's solely done through contractors. Um, so, the requirements that we do have for integrated pest management really come to us through our stormwater permit. And in our stormwater permit, which is also called the MS4 permit, um, but stormwater permit I think is the best uh, way to think about it. Uh, this comes to us from the uh, Regional Water Quality Control Board. It gets renewed every five years or so, five to seven years, uh, and they have different issues. Uh, our current one has, uh, or the, the future one will have a prohibition of the use of diazinon. I don't think that's anything that we use in the city, but we would have to, in a policy, explicitly state that to meet this requirement for our permit. And that we also will need to report the use of all pesticides by city staff and contractors in the stormwater annual report. And that's something that we aren't currently doing. We do not like an up citywide policy could set that reporting requirement and give the authority of one entity to roll up all that information into our, our report. So uh, that's one of the things that we would like to see to meet these requirements in our policy. 
Uh, I'd like to kind of just go into a variety of the different landscapes that we are managing uh, in the city so that you can have an understanding of, of some of the issues that might come up uh, with an integrated uh, pest management strategy. So we have ball fields and playgrounds. Um, and you know, the community feedback that we get on these are is they want weed free infields. They don't want a ball when they hit it in the infield bouncing off a weed and shooting in another direction. They want resilient fields that can um, stand the, you know, the use um, and uh, have enough time. Um, they don't want ground dwelling rodents in the turf fields. You know, they don't, they want a risk of injury to people as they're running and hit a, you know, a, a hole that didn't look like a hole until they stepped on it. Um, and they also want a minimum use of pesticides. And so those are some of the things that we're hearing about um, for ball fields and playgrounds. More of the naturalized areas, and these are, you can think of like at Howarth Park, but also <clears throat> I would say some properties that the water department owns that are more uh, ag and then have wild lands to them. Uh, people want the ability to walk on trails. So there's a trail on uh, our Kelly farm uh, out uh, that connect, it's called the Laguna Trail, but it's on our farm. It's, it's run by the regional parks, uh, but people want those areas to be um, open. Um, they also are concerned about how we're managing these landscapes to ensure that they're not sources for wildfires in the midst of their city. So they, they have a low tolerance to see five, six foot tall weeds growing in these areas. Uh, and that a lot of people are, are concerned that some of these natural areas really need to be natural so that when we are sending people out uh, going on hikes and things, they're seeing the native fauna and flora living um, in these areas. And you can see a lot of our creek trails meet that uh, criteria. And uh, Howarth Park, I think, is a gem uh, in the city as far as a park with um, natural areas. We have ponds and levees and dams. Uh, the community feedback is that they want a uh, minimum base of pond weeds. So we will need in our integrated pest management strategy, some mechanism for controlling these pond weeds. Um, uh, and we have a separate permit that deals with that uh, in the parks department. They also want safe, well-maintained levees and dams. Uh, so that if they're downstream of one of these, they don't have to worry that they're going to fail due to um, lack of management. And then also we have um, the Department of Safety of Dams, DSOD requirements, that these dams be managed to a particular level. In particular, um, some of the most um, difficult pesticides that get used are going to be pesticides used on rodents um, because we can't really have um, gopher activity and ground squirrel activity on these surfaces. Uh, if they get in there, we have regulations uh, to do that. Otherwise, we would have to abandon the infrastructure altogether. Um, so we do have management requirements under that that need to be, you know, informed uh, as we develop an integrated pest management. Is that state strategy. or federally mandated? That's state. Okay. Yeah. Um, we have roadsides and medians. Uh, so, uh, you know, some of the challenges we've had with roadsides is they're difficult areas to work in, especially, especially the medians. Uh, and if the weeds get tall enough, you start to lose sight lines and traffic issues with uh, pedestrians and vehicles. Um, if they can't see somebody coming because they're hidden in the weeds, um, you know, it's, it's something that's important, but then it's also difficult for staff, you know, to work in these areas because it is dangerous to be out there, uh, weeding and, um, uh, uh, working in these environments. So, uh, that's another type of environment. And then we have our city owned farms and a lot of these farm areas have naturalized components to them where restoration is going on and that there are weed infestations that are um, difficult weeds to manage, uh, perennial pepperweed being one of them. Um, and we have uh, nonprofit um, organizations that assist with us in managing some of these lands. Uh, and so the IPM policy would apply to their efforts as well. Um, 
And then we have farmers who are actually raising crops on these lands, and they have a desire not to have a bunch of weed seeds in there that could be toxic to their animals that would be feeding off of the, the hay crops. I will say that uh, in my time working around the farmers, I have not seen any of them ever spray, but the integrated pest management policy would apply to those activities as well. So just want to make sure that you understood that. And then we have our city owned institutional landscapes. And this seems to be something that we, you know, from the last discussion, we feel we have a lot of control over. Um, but the community feedback is they want aesthetically pleasing landscapes. They don't want just um, uh, these, in, these institutional landscapes be, you know, unkempt and looking um, poorly maintained. Um, and they want places for community gathering so that they can come to these places and feel that it is a safe place to gather. Um, and I think the city hall landscape has been has been a really good example of that, um, of people having that opportunity to interface with the landscape before and after meetings. Uh, and then a lot of times of the year, it looks really nice. Um, so this is a part of the talk where I was hoping that we could kind of talk about what it is that you might like to see us put into our integrated pest management so that we can come back with um, a policy, a draft policy that is, is akin to something you'd be interested in seeing us bring to the full council and provide us feedback. And then you'd shoot holes in that, right? And tell us how we could make that better. And then um, also kind of as we're getting this feedback, how you would like, I showed those different landscapes that we have um, how those operational impacts, you know, should be considered. Should we choose a path that might be more expensive in maintenance um, and, and materials? You know, how, you know, you would like us to consider those um, impacts uh, as a part of this IPM policy. And then I have a little bit more after this. I'll talk about next steps and things like that. But I thought, you know, this would be a good time to provide feedback. Okay. Or I could go through the next steps. How about go all the way through it? We'll ask questions, get public comment, Great. do all that sort of thing. Okay. So the next steps are really, uh, we would take the feedback from this discussion, draft a citywide integrated pest management policy for you to review again. So there would be an actual document in front of you. Um, and we would bring that back to here and, you know, no sooner than December, depending on what you'd like to see um, and what we would like to make sure that we ground truth. But we would like to be coming back in the next couple of months with this policy. Um, and then we would bring that to city council. Once we have something you would ideally recommend to city council, uh, then we would bring that to city council, get that feedback, um, and then finalize uh, the policy. And then we can start putting that into all of our um, bids for any landscape, uh, help us um, you know, be very clear what the city wants when a contractor is gonna try to work with the city. Um, and um, Paul Lowenthal is not here today, uh, but you know, I think as we're developing some of this concepts, we might wanna talk if there are, uh, if the committee is interested in prohibitions, would there be exceptions for public safety and things like that? And that's what uh, we would want Paul Lowenthal uh, here to speak about. Uh, I think once we get more into the policy, he would be attending this meeting just so that he could answer from his um, uh, standpoint. Great. That's it. All right. Thanks. Uh, so I'll start off with a couple of questions if that works for you. Um, so first, uh, I have a, a little bit of a tick every time I hear from somebody that we don't have a policy uh, on some of this for the for the council because we did in 2018 voted unanimously on a direction and because it was unanimous we never formalized it in an ordinance so even though we don't have a technical ordinance we do have clear direction from the previous council from 2018 uh, on how to how to move forward on this. And, and if I remember correctly, it was mostly related to the landscaping contract at the time. And so my first question is really, how has the landscaping contract been operating uh, with the previous direction from council not to use synthetic herbicides, uh, particularly in our public spaces? Where are we currently using synthetic herbicides, if at all? And how does that feed into this discussion about the IPM 
and how does it sync up with the contract? Well, I think I'd like to call Jen Santos up here to answer that. Um, thank you, Jen. Sure. Great job, Sean. Thank you. Hello again, Jen Santos, Acting Director for Recreation and Parks. And uh, the question was, where are we using synthetic herbicides right now? And the answer is nowhere at the moment because the overall direction from the city management team in 2018 to staff was not to not to be moving forward with any synthetic herbicides at the at that moment. So uh, prior to that, though, we um, looked at it as again, like Sean mentioned, although we technically aren't using Russian River friendly guidelines, we use that process of elimination where we look at what can we do uh, uh, that is the least toxic. And then if we can't do anything else and we need to use a uh, herbicide, we look at that. And so um, a lot of that was going to be on the um, around sports fields in the season where sports were not being played, where they were closed. Uh, we would come and spray for that. Uh, at times we had used uh, pre-emergence to try to help us manage some of the uh, landscaping that you would see, not necessarily across the street at City Hall, but generally like that um, to help us control weeds. And again, around the uh, warning track and baseball fields uh, outside of the season. And other than that, it was very limited use. And I'm looking to my team. Did I miss anything? Our, our experts are really over here. <laughs> Just in the medians. Right. Yeah. I, thank you. Yes. In, in roadway landscapings, um, again, it's an effective tool occasionally as needed because when we're putting um, folks out in those meetings, it is meetings, it's dangerous. And so we want to limit that and using uh, uh, having that in our tool belt, so to speak, is, a, is an effective tool when needed. So those are the locations. And then I can report out for the water department. Yeah. They are not using them. Okay. I have a, when you talked about the, the medians, I know that's a big thing in my district. Um, and because of the amount of roadways we have and getting teams actually to get out there for the safety and visibility, can you speak a little bit on on that? Sure. Yeah. So I, I, I'll elaborate and let me know if I if I missed it. But um, what we had previously was a um, you know a level of service where we would go out to medians ever so often and as needed when we had an outbreak of certain weeds especially weeds that tend to flop into roadways or into pedestrian travel lanes uh, we could use uh, a pesticide occasionally from time to time on there um, now what we're doing instead of using pesticides is repeatedly sending folks out um, and higher frequency in order to remove weeds to get a certain and once they start to flop so you'll see weeds that are higher now that's probably a change that the uh, community's seen is taller weeds they last longer they don't you know especially if there's a, a certain invade invasive species um, and so we have a lot higher frequency going out there within reason we just don't you know again don't have that other tool in our toolbox we also haven't um, asked our contractor or our staff to increase because uh, we don't have the corresponding funding to go with that. Mm -hmm. So the, the level of service has stayed the same, but the tool has been removed from our toolbox. So um, it's a little bit harder to get out on those medians because uh, sometimes there's nowhere to park. So you're, you've got people running across with mowers and trimmers and, and things like that. And, and we have training for that for sure. Um, and we have uh, put up um, in some places, cones to help keep those folks really uh, safe out there. But it is, it is a little bit more dangerous. Uh, people are commuting; they're not maybe not paying attention, and um, so those are the places that are, are are really a highlight for us to keep our workers safe. Thank you. I do know from talking with with Paul, even though he's not here today, I know he's particularly concerned in the wooey. And, and more specifically, the burn scar of some of the invasive species that are moving in. How are we currently dealing with those? Is it just mechanical removal at the moment? It's uh, mechanical control, I think is the best we could say. So the number one issue that I think, um, the number one plant type is uh, uh, an invasive broom. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, that's coming in, uh, and the problem is it grows very dense. Scott dense. Broom? Well, there's Scotch and French um, Broom uh, are the two common ones. Yeah. My colleagues are all about the We don't have so much Italian Broom. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and so uh, that's a woody uh, plant. Um, and uh, so currently we're just, I think, mechanically uh, mowing and cutting those things down, um, but that doesn't remove them uh, and requires uh, more activity. Um, and I'll just add to that too. One of the things we've all been talking about as we've been looking at, uh, you know, what does a policy look like is that uh, uh, since we've been looking at mechanical means only really as an agency, uh, the seedbed is growing. So we're getting very, very dense seedbed. And that's why uh, you know, I don't want to speak on behalf of, of the fire department, but that's one of the things we've talked about, you know, commonly among each other is that that's something we're noticing is that the weeds are um, seeding a lot faster because it's hard to get out there with mechanical means only. Um, so you have a pretty dense seed bed uh, now, three, 18, 19, <laughs> about four or five years now. So it's just something we're keeping in mind. Um, my, so my questions are around um, one, it, it'll all tie back. Go with me on this little trip. Uh, is the oak borer beetle, beetle on your radar? Because um, that's like speaking of invasive species is something that you know I never hear about, but seems to be a great concern. I, I will say that um, you know, some of the earliest signs, we have a, a number of majestic oaks on our city owned farms, as we do in our parks, and it's uh, attacking our, our um, valley oaks, uh, which have largely been spared from the sudden oak death uh, infestation. That is another invasive species that um, hit us. Um, so we are, uh, I will say that I have been paying attention to it, but we, we don't really have tools to um, address them. You know, it would be insecticides um, injected into trees, which um, would be synthetic. Um, I don't know that in the water department that it's our core mission mm -hmm. to preserve these oaks against that. Uh, we would work with um, nonprofit entities like the um, California Native Plant Society. We have a very active chapter, the Milo Baker chapter, um, that could provide technical guidance um, uh, to, to support that. But it is a new infestation for us, and it is one of deep concern for sure. Right. And for the parks team, we do have a, a huge concern now that we're already seeing it in parks. So we're looking at what can we do um, to help. Uh, provide some procedures for ourselves and our contractors on how to deal with the invasive beetle. Um, I know that our staff have been attending seminars and trying to get better educated on it. And we have heard the same thing about the use of a pesticide is helpful in um, reducing the, you know, reducing the beetle, but we need a little bit more research at this point. Uh, and that's what I'm hearing. Before yeah, we I mean, it just really started appearing in our county, um, and and the the first identification really close to our was actually the western part of the city, so um, or just outside of the city, mm -hmm. so um, and that's where our farms are, um, where well, we have yeah. a lot of valley oaks. Obviously, just a lot of concern around that. I was reading, um, I think it was. Uh, Bill Bryson does this, you know, does the Appalachian Trail and he goes through the history of the Forest Service. And one of the things he mentions in it is that a, ch a old chestnut population just sort of fell down, like, I'm sure you know this, like just overnight essentially from an infestation. And it's always on my mind, you know, how Santa Rosa would look if we lost our oak trees. It would be devastating. But th what that really brings me back is you mentioned staff, you mentioned contractors. And, you know, it's my understanding that we have about 20, 21 parks maintenance crews, and that's about a third of our historical staff. And so I think, you know, again, you know, we were talking about false dichotomies before, you know, when it comes to environment versus recreation. I think that when it comes to, to maintenance versus environment, you know, we, we really have, as a council, failed you in leadership on your staffing levels. Um, and I think that it's incumbent upon us to, to look at that and address that 
you know, we're wanting to make up for, for time, for space, for money with chemicals. And that's, that's not an approach that I'm going to be comfortable with. I understand that, you know, if we're going to lose like our entire, you know, oak species and the only answer is to, to you know, it's not because of lack of, of resources. It's like, that's the, it's like getting an injection or a vaccine. You just got to do it sometimes. But, but I'm not seeing that that be the, the overall thing, you know, whether it's medians. I mean, a lot of people do a lot of dangerous work in this city, whether it's police officers or people who work, you know, the electrical facility at our, at our, you know, wastewater treatment facility. These, these things are dangerous, but we can do them well. And, um, and I'm, I'm not so worried about that. What I'm worried about is not having enough people to do them well. And so that would be my request is that when this stuff comes back is to present us with um, what it would take from a human power perspective to get it done well. And where are the very limited absolute last resource situations where we have to use chemicals to, to deal with these situations? And also what can we do, and this goes back to the first thing, to change the landscape in such a way that deals with the heavy seed cover that, that takes a proactive approach to restoring the natural habitat, whether that's working with the Native Plant Society or other environmental groups. Um, I'd rather give you all the resources that you need to do what I think is, is the right thing and that I think most environmentalists on your staff would, would want to get done. So, um, and, and I am really interested also, as kind of a side note about the rodent thing, I thought that was really interesting. And I, I continue to be, the, the problem with, with you know, putting pesticides in rodents, as you well know, is that they, they don't just end with the rodent. So I'd be really interested to know if at some point, you know, we've now we've got driverless cars, you know, at some they, and they're running over people. Will there will there be um, will there be you know some sort of you know Roomba like thing that can go after these creatures or some other invention that's mechanical <laughs> hop? Yeah, something else that's gonna you know can go down there and and nab their their adorable little invasive selves and move them elsewhere. That would be what I would do, or, or you know, probably destroy them, which is what I think. Victoria do. wants to introduce cats. <laughs> we'll be back to talk yes. about dogs. <laughs> yes, I think, I think I've read this one before. I think <laughs> that, um, that we can introduce cats. Um, no, I'm I'm joking about that, but but I am really seriously interested in wherever we can be a pilot or, or a test case to try something different. I know we we just got to get rid of them, but but it doesn't, to my mind. I, I mean, I I'm not an engineer, but I could see an engineer making a product like that. Yeah, in our in our backyard, we're particularly happy when we see the possums at night because we have chickens and they keep the area nice and clean mm. uh, from ticks and other things, fleas. So, any additional questions? Uh, questions? No, no I think I gave my comment. Sorry. That's <laughs> fine. Let's go to public comment then. Go for it. Um, hi everyone. I'm Megan Count from Sonoma Safe Ag Safe Schools. Thank you so much for bringing this forward and for the great presentation. Um, I was a part of the whole thing that happened with Santa Rosa Water and the city of Santa Rosa um, many years ago. Um, the city's come a long way. I'm so proud. Um, you guys are doing an amazing job, and I can't wait to see a citywide IPM. It's the great next step. Um, I advocate for a synthetic-free pesticide IPM um, for routine maintenance. So as far as exceptions go, you know, emergencies for fire or really bad invasives or oak stuff, like I get it, like the city needs exceptions. Um, and I say synthetic pesticides because if we just ban one, then we get another one and they're really none of them are very safe. Um, and I think it's great that the city is still really minimizing its pesticide use um, and even going above and beyond what I was aware of that the city was doing um, four years ago or so. Um, Regarding median strips, um, this is a problem area that a lot of cities see. I've helped a lot of cities transition away from pesticides. Um, and I would just like to recommend if there are areas where it's hard to maintain weeds, maybe there needs to be something else planted there. Maybe, I hate to say this, maybe it needs to get, um, you know, put some pavement over it. Um, you know, Windsor has this video out that shows that a hundred square foot garden can really help pollinators and help inv um, not invasive. Uh, endangered species like monarchs, why can't uh, median strips be pollinator gardens, something planted in something we want so that something we don't want doesn't grow. 
Um, something else I'd like to bring forward is the use of grazing. So the city of Petaluma recently is managing all of their large open spaces with grazing and they just put hoofs on the ground last summer. Um, a colleague of mine is actually helping to organize their whole grazing program. Grazing can help you reduce um, and or really eliminate the unwanted seed bank that you have in the city and it can do it in two seasons. It's amazing what, what putting goats and sheep back on the land can do. Um, and also, you know, I really would encourage the city to use indigenous land stewardship practices to really heal the ecosystems, get stuff out that's not supposed to be there to make the land naturally fire safe. Um, my organization has done pilot studies on this. It's been super effective at helping neighborhoods for, um, support themselves and not be afraid of fire. Um, so, you know, raising and indigenous land stewardship absolutely on Santa Rosa's more wild lands, I think is really important. Um, I definitely would uh, really support an annual report on what every department in the city is using. The county does that right now, and it's amazing. Um, it's just as far as building a relationship between concerned citizens, like the people I represent um, and staff, and it's been great for relationship building and just knowing what's going on. Um, I would uh, uh, suggest that you talk to the county about um, the pond weeds. They've been through a lot of stuff with Azola. Um, I actually have a few ideas on how to manage that better, um, you know, whether you're spraying it or you're dredging it. Um, but, you know, do reach outside to other departments in the county that are, are trying to figure out this work. Um, and also, I just have a question um, about the people that are doing hay cultivation um, and also people that do um, restoration on city lands, like the Laguna Foundation or whoever else. Or do they need to report their pesticide use um, directly to the city because I have seen, and this is an old spray records, um, there being 2,4-D being used on, I think, city-owned land um, for hay cultivation, so a selective herbicide. Um, and since these aren't organic hay cultivation because they're using biosolids, um, that might, I know you haven't seen it happening, but it could be happening. It's something I think about. Um, I live just over the Laguna from all the beautiful hay cultivation in Sebastopol, um, and I think about that a lot. Um, those are my comments right now, but I look forward to being a, a part of this process. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Megan. Anybody else? Go ahead. I'm Bob Chifola, and uh, I, there, there are a couple things I'm curious about. Uh, the first one is, what is the city's jurisdiction? Uh, I've been told uh, in some discussions that uh, public schools are separate from the, count the, the city and so aren't under their jurisdiction. Santa Rosa Junior College is another area that's within city limits, but not in... Uh, you know, also has jurisdictions of their own. Um, and, and what about the county pockets that the city surrounds or includes? Or, you know, that, that's, that's my first question. Uh, the second one, there was a word, a word in the, one of the early slides, and that word was turf. And I think it's important to define what that means because previous to 1964, it always meant growing green grass. But in 1964, chemgrass was introduced and soon after astroturf and then many other turf uh, terms, artificial turf, uh, I can't even remember them all, synthetic turf, and, and now the latest is all-weather turf. So I think it's really important that we define what the word is so we know what we're referring to because they're very different. Thank you. The two. Any other comments? All right. We'll bring it back then. So I heard a couple of questions, but I'm going to ex actually expand them a little bit because uh, I heard specifically about uh, hay. I heard about unincorporated urban pockets, but I'll even say integration with the county and um, other possible jurisdictions. We all share the same waterways. We are right up about one another, right? So how does this plan or how would this plan integrate with other efforts around the area? So uh, the city-owned farms are um, uh, part of the city, uh, and so they're within our jurisdiction. Um, and so we currently do not have restrictions on, or we do have res yeah. no restrictions on the leases when the farmers lease our property. They are not required to report to us um, any of that currently. So that is something that could be amended uh, in, in uh, future contracts as they come in. Um, and, uh, 
in this policy could help provide that direction. Um, the uh, so that's kind of you know that piece. We don't have jurisdiction with our policy over what they do in the county. Um, when you are applying pesticides as a business or a farmer or um, uh, uh, or uh, the city, you are using a licensed pesticide applicator and they are required to fill out pest reports monthly and that goes to the Ag Commissioner's office. <clears throat> and that process is discoverable uh, through the Public Records Act. Um, it's not made available uh, very easily, and I think members of the audience could confirm that that's true. Um, uh, so that is a way that the city could go about getting that information. Um, but, you know, this is a right to farm county and you won't find an integrated pest management strategy like we're talking about today being applied to farms in the county anytime soon. I, I just, I don't see any of that. And I know there's been a lot of concern where schools and ag properties butt up next to each other, what the farmer's doing um, and the kids are there um, at that time uh, with spray drift and things like that. But an integrated pest management strategy for the city, I, I think, would most likely operate independently um, um, of what the county is is doing. That's really helpful, and uh, I think it would be great as we develop this to put in some of our own metrics on how we are going to report back to the community, even if it's just in the annual report, we have an update on what we used when we had to use it for the exemptions. Um, I also, you know, we had discussions earlier in the year about uh, our new assembly member, Damon Connolly's bill, uh, specifically asking Caltrans to follow the city's plan. And so whatever we develop, I hope we'll also send a letter to Caltrans and ask them that, you know, we've developed this plan with all due diligence. We've met with our community members. We've talked about what we want to see as a community and ask them to respect that as well. Because um, it sounds like for the most part, when it's city land, people follow it, they're required to. And at the same time, I know Caltrans and other jurisdictions that have their own, uh, to, to the gentleman's point, uh, their own jurisdiction that overlaps that they don't. Uh, so I'd hope that we would do that as well. Right. And, and you know, of course, reaching out to schools who also are, you know, the jurisdiction is by the state as well, including our elementary high schools and um, and our uh, junior college. Yep. Any other comments? Um, I was just going to stress again uh, about the, the medians, and I couldn't agree with my colleague more. Um, one, it, it is dangerous, Janet. I, I agree with you on that. But also, um, if we're not providing you with the correct staffing to, to do things, so uh, it's almost like taking the tools out of your toolbox and then still asking you to perform the, the same work. It gets a little difficult. Um, and so I know that we've heard that from staff and I wanted to thank my colleague for bringing um, that up. And so we need to address, I, I agree with the ICM, but I just think that we need to address uh, staffing issues if we're going to continue to implement things that do not allow um, our staff to get their jobs done uh, effectively and efficiently. And, um, and, and the, the medians are things that I hear about all the time because that's a big thing in my district. Um, and so that is something that, that came to mind um, for me. But definitely, um, I, I think you're on the right track. I don't think there's anything that you put in there that I would, um, that I would disagree with. And... Um, also, just I, I think uh, Chair Rogers hit it perfectly. It's just our commitment to work with jurisdictions um, that are uh, around the city and go through the city, and but knowing that they may not always take on our policy, but just that we have the commitment to work to work with them and, and share our our policy with them. 
I think I made my, my perspective clear when I'm during our question section. Um, but the one thing that I would like to know tags back to our first conversation about synthetic turf and jurisdiction is um, Director Burke said that because there, it does in some way connect our water, water, um, our wastewater plant or our waterways, that we may have some jurisdiction. So when it does come back to us in any form, I think that it'd be interesting to, to know um, if we do actually have some sort of backdoor way to to help compel our our neighboring jurisdictions or our integrated juris or overlay jurisdictions to to maybe join with us um, in this integrated pest management program uh, and and some tools that we might be able to offer them if so but I, I think that if it applies to turf it seems logical that it would also apply um, to this could, could I ask a clarification um, so uh, are you imagining that we would reach out and see hey we developed this policy what do you think or are you more interested in us um, looking to what by them having a, a utility certificate uh, getting service that we can compel them to uh, adopt our policy right well I, well I really like the the, the latter um, I think it's a heavy handed to start with and uh, because I just would like to see the elimination of, of pesticides unless it's an emergency or an urgency but but at any rate, I just want the question answered. Um, do we have the ability to compel them? And, and I think that's a good starting point for at least opening, because once you know that you have the authority to do so, you can go and say, hey, we have the authority. We would like to work with you to gain you know, partnership and, and compliance and see where we go from there. Great. Okay. I think that will We'll be doing it for one. We could do it for both. <laughs> so, and Chair Rogers, also, as far as I know, the schools do have some sort of a policy because if they put anything on the grounds, they send a letter home um, to the parents all the time, notifying them if they're going to use um, something on the school grounds that might be that might affect the children. Um, so they do have a policy. I just don't know what it is, but I do recall getting those. I feel like the uh, adamant shaking head in the uh in the audience there might have something yeah. to do with that one. Yeah, so I mean, that's why I said just the commitment to continue to work with other stakeholders as we already do. I think Santa Rosa is pretty, we're pretty friendly and we already work with a lot of people. So I think our commitment just to continue to do that. Great. So then the last comment that I'll make, uh, just because I want to make sure that I punctuate the point, uh, is it was brought up not to necessarily look at the IPM through the lens of specific chemicals, but specific types of mm -hmm. pesticides. Because even, you know, I, when, when I was working in the legislature, it was neonicotinoids was the big one. And then, you know, those have largely shifted into different names, different types of chemical structures, but still the same impact. So if we could write the IPM in a way that is kind of all encompassing for what we're trying to accomplish, even if that chemical changes from year to year, uh, that might be a good place for us to not have to keep coming back. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, almost like a description of the chemical type or the impacts. Correct. So neonicotinoids re related to bees and and butterflies. You know, non tar You know, affecting non-target species. Um, yeah. I suspect when we actually have a draft plan uh, for people to see that we can wordsmith to achieve the goal. But but that's what I've heard over and over again from folks is build a plan that focuses on the impact more so than one specific thing that we'll have to come back and amend. Well, what I what I heard is uh, your initial statement was to go back to the 2018 council direction, which was um, provided uh, for the parks department and their contract uh, to be a starting point, which was, um, I, I believe, as I recall, the main point of that was no synthetic. Correct. Um, yep. Pesticides. Yep. Um, and so I think that we can incorporate that um we could look at you know where what an exception process would be i also heard that that there might be outside of routine maintenance there might be you know extraordinary circumstances as we talked with the oak four um you know uh that that there would be you know develop what that process would look like or fire uh, life and safety issues um 
there was uh, a desire to hear a little more information on how um, various, you know, removing tools affect staffing to, to maintain a level of service. So an information about that uh, for this committee to consider. Um, and then uh, some research into um, optional uh, burrowing mammal um, control. Yep. I apologize. There's one one piece of this that as you're reading it off, I, I think that I, I miss, which is, um, you know, through the, the mechanical process, um, just a, a question about using two stroke um, engine mowers or, or other additional things that are really also super toxic. Um, uh, you know, that's got to be part of this discussion as well. There is state law that is already driving that change and um, yeah, not as fast as I'd like to see. Okay. So. Um, I'm so, just wondering if we don't bring that as like a sidebar because would it be part of the policy? It, and we could talk it, about it. Integrated yeah. pest management. So, uh, or if we're going to manage things, I mean, how we manage them, I think, is on the table here. So. Right. Right. Okay. okay. I mean, even at a minimum, we could discuss it in the same meeting and see how it all fits. Because so I, I do know a lot of landscape companies are in the process of retooling right now to meet those uh, regulations, and the technology has really advanced. Um, but it is more, you know, it's just another expense, and so we can come back with some information on that. Um, I had a question, Chair. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I know, and you brought it up in your public comment about the the animals and the grazing and i know that that is something that we have um we've done or is it something that we're still doing i i think so but i think last i heard we are having a hard time finding enough goats and sheep that it's their high demand now <laughs> okay because i do know james, that that's james is nodding his head along i know we're this, still doing it this was jack tickets his favorite we're not doing it currently because of the availability but we did i mean, like we know about it we did i know we have done it in the past yes and so. that's our plan to continue to off as as a pest management system to continue to do that and the fire department and, and parks have been working with srjc to um, look at a youth training program or a student training program, a kid for grazing. program? yeah for great a grazing program so we're looking at bringing that next year i just want to acknowledge how good that joke was for a minute <laughs> <laughs> <In goats. laughs> i appreciate it um and i know that there were specific neighborhoods actually up in fountain grove that were using it as like a festival neighborhood building community building thing every year so and the water department does have um, grazing on our levees now. Um, in the past, we had used um, uh, synthetic herbicides to control weeds on our levees, and so we've moved to um, having grazing. But we use cows because that's that's the livestock that's mostly there um, for us. And then some we do actually use goats. I mean, sheep. You know, we have mm -hmm. a sheep farmer who will move. Very cool. Cool. So. All right. Sounds like you got some good direction. I look forward to having it come back for us all to poke at it. Great. Uh, so the last thing on our agenda for today's meeting is future agenda items. All right. So um, we will be returning in the near future with um, additional updates on both the uh, artificial turf and the IPM. So those won't be too far out. And also the greenhouse gas reduction strategy. We will be bringing that back to you as well. Still timing and dates on those yet to be determined, but they are on our future items list. Um, there was one other that we were just discussing also. Um, Oh, and that is the bicycle and pedestrian master plan update as well. So we'll look to be putting that on schedule. I think. Excellent. Yeah. Sorry, quick question. Um, so would it be appropriate to ask if we could visit um, in the future uh, recycling at the parks when you rent like a, a gazebo or something that they have the different types of recycling available? at the specific locations sure I, I just noticed because i rented something and i was like what do i do with my recycling yeah like it was just 
a lot. So yeah, and then also um, I, I made these comments on the general plan update that we did. But when we look at the greenhouse gas reduction strategies uh, as a primer, it might be worth reading through some of the climate actions that we just discussed for the general plan. So I intend to go through them like a checklist mm -hmm. uh, with this committee as we as we go. But yeah, we can add that in there too. Great. Let's go to public comments, see if there's anything folks think that we are missing that they'd like to see us discuss. All right, seeing none, we'll adjourn. Thanks, everybody. I just want to say it is great to see everyone here. This is awesome. I love this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.